Hey, and welcome to week 17 as we come into Romans 8, 18 through 39. Now, as we come into this section, I do want to, to kind of get started a little bit quicker than usual because I think this video will be um, a bit longer. Uh, just given the content, given that we're starting a new section, um, we are going to be jumping into this with two feet. And so I hope that you all would be prepared for this, that we have, that you've tuned in to the previous 16 weeks of this class, that you would have focused um, throughout on all of the different uh, important things that we've built so far, um, because this section does not exist in a vacuum. And many people treat this section as if it should be um, just placed kind of off to itself and we just talk about it and then we run away from it as fast as possible. And instead, I think what we ought to do in this section of Romans, in Romans 8, 18 through 39, and then in the larger election sections of Romans kind of in the middle of the book, I think instead of running away from it or being terrified of it, we should explore it in the context of the rest of the book. And so I hope that you guys would have finished the last 16 weeks of this course. And as we get started, um, just be prayerful and reading through this and reading through your study Bibles and, and spending time here because it's going to take a little bit of time. As usual, I expect you guys to have read through Romans 8, 18 through 39 already, um, kind of garnered your own opinions of it so far. Um, and I'll just be commentating on it. I will read several of the verses uh, just because it helps with talking through this. So as we get started today, I'm excited uh, to be able to do that. Let's pray and we'll get started this this morning, afternoon, whatever time it is for you. Dearly Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us minds to, to comprehend your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit as he works in each and every one of our lives to, to help us um, understand scripture. We know that we would have no chance at understanding it without him. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with us, guide us, protect us, help us to understand your word well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as we get into week 17, we're going to be focused on a few important questions in Romans 8, 18 through 39. We're going to first focus on 18 through 25, which is what is the end for all Christians. Uh, we've been kind of talking into that a little bit coming out from uh, Romans 8, 1 through 17. And then we're going to talk about what role does the Holy Spirit play in our lives in verses 26 and 27. We're going to see what events work together for our good. And that'll be a surprising answer in verse 28. Then we're going to talk about encouragement in and through election in 29 and 30. Um, then we're going to ask two questions as we end there. That's going to be most of our body of our lesson today. And then if we're going to answer those two questions. If God chose you, what are you worried about and what can separate you from Christ in 31 through 34 and 35 through 39. So as we come into this first section of Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25, as we come into this, I think it's interesting that, that coming out of the life in the Spirit and the heirs with Christ passages that we talked about last week, we're going to talk a little bit more about future glory, future glorification, and the things that, that we get to experience as Christians. And Paul is going to be concerned from here about how we attain that. And so he's going to make sure right off the bat that the suffering we go through as Christians will end in our glorification, which means we will end up in heaven. And that should be a great encouragement to us. But he's going to front load it with that. But then towards the end, he's also going to talk about it again in a much more rounded out way. And so we won't talk much more about that right now, but we'll save that for verses 35 through 39, which I think are some of those hopeful verses in all of Romans. He also points out that our fall brought corruption to all of creation, but one day we will be renewed and we will be rebuilt perfectly. Um, he talks about the creation being subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And I, I think that's interesting that he points forward to the creation and the recreation of the things that we know. And so we look forward to being resurrected and redone, rebuilt in perfect, um, again, as we were intended to be. And we look forward to that as um, our glorification in heaven, as sons and as daughters of Christ. And we're the first fruits of the Spirit groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption. And I think that's an incredible passage. But again, it doesn't come out of context. And it, it follows some passages about who we are by the Spirit of God 
and talking about our sufferings and encouraging us through our sufferings. And this passage really is an encouragement section. And I think this passage could likely be called Encouragement and Election. If you're watching this from right now, Media, I believe that's what I've titled this entire section. And you'll get to see why in just a moment. As we come into verses 26 and 27, I think these are interesting verses because they're often quoted out of context. And it says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And this is the famous passage where the Holy Spirit groans for us with words that we cannot express, or intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express, or groanings too deep for words. And we cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. I think this is a great quote from from the famous theologian and reformer Martin Luther. He says, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me by his gifts, sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. And if you know anything about Martin Luther, you know that is very true of his own life. He tried. um, He was a Roman Catholic um, monk for a significant amount of time. He was well-learned. He was a professor. He was teaching. And yet he still realized that if he tried to earn his way into heaven, he would fail. And that's why he is so... Um, smitten with the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in his life. The Holy Spirit is the person through whom we receive God's love. If you look back to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says this, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. How? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so we know we receive the love of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's the, the person that does that work. Now, when we get into Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we're going to talk about a verse that I think is is often used, and we don't finish it, and we also don't put it in its context. So I want to do that today. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And it is true, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Not some things, not most things, all things. We want to make sure that we affirm that along with the scripture. One of the ways that I think is helpful to see these actions, um, these, these things that happen in our lives that may not be immediately recognizable as good, but can be viewed that way in hindsight, are through some action distinctions. This comes from a theologian named R.C. Sproul as he talks through these different actions, these different things, and these different classifications for actions that happen in our lives. And if this is boring to you, you can skip through this. Um, as long as we understand that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. I think that is the the key, right? Um, That those things do work out for us and for Christians. Um, But if you want a little bit more information, you can listen into the next 30 seconds or so. Um, Good, good actions are actions that are inherently good. They're done from a a good place, a good, um, they're, they're done from a good uh, moral, they're done good ethically, and they're not corrupted. Um, so they're good actions. They're they're inherently good things to do, and they're done perfectly. They're not done with a side action. They're not done with a, a side motive. They're they're done in a perfect way. And currently, really, the only the only beings that do things like this would be God and His holy angels that are completely uncorrupted and um, and doing good actions all the time. Um, one thing that we're, we're, we're used to a lot in human actions is bad good actions, actions that are good, um, good things to do, but done in with a bad motive or corrupted in some way by our sinfulness. And much human action falls into this uh, this intention. Um, bad, bad actions are easier to understand. Um, actions are inherently bad and they're done with bad motives. Um, I think some human action is done there. I think most um, most of these actions are demonic. Um, this is how the devil views things. He does things purposely bad that are done with bad intentions. Um, and so I think his actions would fit into this um, this little bin. And then good, bad actions is the interesting one. Um, actions that are that are bad for us, um, and they're done with good results or with helpful after effects. And I think this is a very interesting one because sometimes things that happen in our lives are obviously bad things, right? A hurricane comes through and wipes out a city or a town or something, an earthquake hits and creates this damage that is, that is done to, to humanity. 
Um, we, uh, somebody goes through and does something awful to someone else. Cancer takes a, a loved one away. There's so many different ways that we can be affected, right? By bad actions. But God and his providence will use those bad actions for our good. And that's what I mean by good, bad actions. Most of these actions are done by people and by natural actions like, um, you know, environmental things, rain, thunderstorms, wind, hail, all of this stuff. And these actions, I think, are what are in view here with Paul, that he's saying that that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. God works all of these bad things together that we would be blessed in it. And I think that's a really important and encouraging thing as we remember. Remember back, we're going to talk at the end about a murder. Um, and this was a time where martyrdom was common in the church. And I think that's a very important thing for us to recognize that those martyrdoms were viewed as as good for the spread of the church and for the health of the, the church. And they were a good thing for the people. They looked at it as a blessing. And I think that's so foreign to us. Um, and I think it comes out of this verse. Now, as we come into 29 and 30, I think we're set up well to understand what these verses are saying because these are meant to be encouraging for Christians. This is a, a topic that's probably not best shared right off the bat in uh, in your evangelism discussions with people. You're, you're probably better off uh, teaching a, a rather seasoned Christian uh, this because it will it, it's just harder to understand. But this is the encouragement that we have in how God saves us. And so the, I wanted to talk a little bit about the doctrine of election. And this is the encouragement and election section. I think this is going to be the longest part of the video. You can put me on double speed if you need to. Um, I'm going to quote a bunch of different scripture. I hope that you look that scripture up. Don't just take my word for it. Look it up. Quiz me on it. Talk to me about it. I'd love to have those discussions. Also, if I only quote one verse, um, read the whole context. I only quote that one verse because it's the clearest, um, but these are all verses in their context that make sense for election. And so I would argue that the doctrine of election is at some level a basic Christian belief. Um, how you understand that may change. Um, and I'm not saying that that uh, if you're an Arminian or a Calvinist, um, you have a different, you know, you're not a Christian or something like that. I'm not saying that. Um, but I am saying that some understanding of it uh, is simply biblical. Um, it's found throughout scripture, both explicitly, um, as it is here in Romans 8, 28 through 30, as well as Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Um, it's also explicit in James 1, 18, 1 Peter 2, 8, 9, John 1, 13, John 6, 44. Um, you can use a bunch of other verses. There are tons of websites that will list all of these out for you. I didn't want to just rattle those off, but that should give you plenty um, to, to determine what the New Testament thinks about that. And it's also implicit in many places. Um, there's a common Hebrew word named, called bahar that is a um, that means God chose. Um, and I think it's implicitly used in many places, such as when Abram is called in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, when he sets up the people of Israel to follow his covenant in Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 9, and then when he's reaffirming the covenant with um, with David in 2 Samuel 7, uh, 23 and 24. I think all of those places um, point out that God intervenes with someone's life and chose them specifically. And also remember from context how God worked in Israel. It was through one chosen people, um, not a generally enlightened or learned class, not from someone that would learn more, but simply through a people group. Um, and so I think the idea of election, the idea of predestination is not new to the New Testament and it's not new to us. How he lays it out is simply clearer here. And so I want to lay it out as Paul lays it out. So we're going to go through um, some, some things uh, phrase by phrase through 29 and 30. Um, but we first know that we, the we know section in verse 28 says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What does it mean to be called? Um, Paul is about to answer that for us with how the mechanics of God's salvation. And so as we go through this, I want you to recognize this is the how and not the message. The message is Jesus Christ died for sinners. Um, this is the, the mechanics, the how of what God has done um, in our lives. In the first section of verse 29, he says, for those whom he foreknew, 
He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The very first section says this, for those whom he foreknew, and we're going to stop there. I'm going to highlight these. They'll be underlined as we go through this kind of road of election. We're going to talk about this whole thing. He foreknew, verse 29, um, section A. What is knowledge? Does God know that we will accept him and therefore choose us from that knowledge? Well, I think that's a possible interpretation, um, and I think there are good Christians that believe this. I don't have issues with this. I think it does change the meaning of the verse. Um, if we think that God's foreknowledge is just a possibility, um, and it's based on us, it changes the meaning of the verse. Because if we're saved by our own decision or merit, um, if to use a, a theological term, if if election, if salvation is conditional upon us, then we've changed the meaning of grace from undeserved to deserved. And at least in some small way, even if it's a simple decision or an act of the heart, it's still an act. It's still something that we have done in order to get something. And I think it's more likely, and I think it fits more fully with the rest of the section, with the context of Romans and the imputation of righteousness that we've referred to even back in Romans 1, 16 and 17, to assume that know in this context means to personally know those whom he will choose. God is omniscient, right? This means that he knows the choices that he will, will, that he will make regardless of our merit. And I think he's pointing that out here. He foreknows these people. And then it's separated off as well. He predestined, 29b says this, um, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He gives us some, some reasons why he does this. Um, and he, this word simply, it's the Greek word paaridzo, which is a sovereign determination in which a fixed or definite limit is sovereignly decreed. And I think this is super interesting because verse 29, part C, talks a little bit more about that. He gives us a reason. Why, is, why are we talking about predestination? Why are we talking about foreknowledge? And he says, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. If God did not do this, we would not become Christians and Christ would have been resurrected for no reason. The redemption he brought, he bought for us is specific. It's actual. We actually become Christians by the work of the Holy Spirit in the plan of God, in the predestined plan of God. Now, I think that's really important as we read through this, because again, remember, it's meant to be encouragement for the Christians. And so he's saying, look at what God has done. And he's using all these past tenses. He's saying, this is happened for you. And it will continue to happen for those Christians who are continuing to come to the knowledge of Christ. In the first section of 30, and this is how 30 uh, completely reads, it says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That first section he called, his calling then is conditional upon his predestination and his foreknowledge not on our actions. We don't want to slip into Roman Catholicism here. We want to say that, that his calling is conditioned, and that's what it's saying here. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Um, and we already know that his predestination is, is connected with his foreknowledge, as we were just talking about in verse 29. And so it's not conditioned on our actions, but on his predestination and foreknowledge. And then that, that calling is then also um, conditioned to something else. He justified in, in 30 part B, our justification, and remember the meaning of that term, being justified is being given God's imputed righteousness back from Romans 1, 16 and 17, is conditioned upon his calling, which is conditioned upon his foreknowledge and predestination. And I think that's interesting because I'm going to start building this chain for you, basically saying that justification is conditioned upon his calling, which is conditioned upon his foreknowledge and his predestination. And we're going to, we're going to add one more thing to that. And notice how this is moving through our lives. We're called, then we're justified, then we are eventually glorified. And our glorification, ending up in heaven with Jesus, is conditioned upon our justification. And our justification is conditioned upon his calling, which is conditioned upon his foreknowledge and his predestination. Now, I think that should all help us with something, right? Because that's a large section. And I know that's a, a tough little thing for, for so few words. But I wanted to point that out because Paul uses that as the center point 
to what he is saying. And what he's saying here is Romans 8, 31 through 34, is that this should be a basis for the peace which we have in Christ Jesus. If God knew you, predestined you, called you, justified you, and he is set on glorifying you, who are you to question that, to be stressed out by that, to live your life as if that were not the case? And I think that's what Paul is, is saying here. No one can bring a charge against God's elect because God is the one protecting you. In verse 35 through 39, he lists out, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ as a Christian. He then launches into this long thing about what can't. And he says, not tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, death, life, angels, rulers, present or future things, powers, height, depth, or anything. Nothing can separate you. Christians, God has chosen you. You might not always feel safe, but from his view, you are safe. Now, one of the things that I wanted to discuss a little bit was a, a murder from the early, earliest sections of the church um, born in the African city of Carthage. And this is the, this woman named Perpetua. And if you're listening to this online, I want you to pause this video and go back and look up Perpetua the Martyr. And you're going to find an article that, that comes out through a website called Plow, plow.com, P-L-O-U-G-H. And I want you to read that article. Um, I'm going to read it to the people in our live class. Um, we're going to talk about her a bit, but I want you to pause it and read that. Now, if you are just coming back from reading that article, I hope that it encouraged you in the way that it encouraged me. Um, I think it's amazing. This young 22 year old woman, uh, goes to her death in such a strong way. What an amazing thing this is. What a beautiful martyrdom this is. And notice her constant refrain of trusting in God. They, they, they offer to free her and she's constantly saying, no, no, I will follow God. And when they finally get to the point where they're going to execute her, she goes to her execution boldly because she knows that she's not the one to be pitied. It's all the people that have denied and have not given their lives up to Christ. And I want that to encourage us today that God is in our corner. We have nothing to fear.